Today I want to talk about understanding cultural imperialism. Okay? Let's start off with what is culture. Now really, today I really want y'all to learn something. Okay? I want you to feel free to write all this down. And I'm not going to wait for you to write it all down. Okay? Because we'll be here forever, all right? But feel free to write. You know, it's not a problem. Okay? And then what I really want you to do is take what you've just heard me teach you today, if you don't have a problem doing it, and go teach it to somebody else. Y'all hear what I'm saying? This is not Dr. Ray's lecture. This is just a message coming from Dr. Ray to you. And I want you to take this and go share it with as many people as you can because it's about freeing our people. Can I get an ashe? Ashe! All right. What is culture? Oh, wow. See, thank you. Did I hear a little baby say ashe? Yes. Oh, right on, little brother. And by the way, for those who don't know what ashe means, it's spelled A-S-E accent in English characters. And it means that I give all the support of the universe into what was just said. Absolutely. Okay? That's the African way of affirmation. Mm -hmm. We who grew up in the church, we used to say an amen. Mm -hmm. That's, right. That's that, We mean the same thing. Okay? But so that you'll know, amen is not an affirmation. Amen is really one of the ancient names of the Almighty. Okay, from ancient Egypt, and it's pronounced Amen. Not Amen. You see what I'm saying? Okay, what happens is the Europeans went into ancient Egypt and saw the name, one of the names of God, okay, and attached it to the end of their prayers. Am I making sense? Yes. So next time you're sitting in church and you say Amen, I want you to hear my voice. <laughs> what I just said, okay? Say, Ashe, and then everybody in church is going to look at you, what? <laughs> what is culture? Culture is the set of ideas, concepts, and agencies used to structure the behavior of a people. Did y'all grab that? I repeat, culture is the set of ideas what you need to ask is whose ideas? Mm. Concepts, whose concepts? And agencies, what agencies? Mm -hmm. Used to structure the behavior of a people. Because if you control what people think, you will control their behavior. Does everybody understand that? That's culture. Today's lecture is cultural imperialism. So let's deal with that. What is cultural imperialism? Cultural imperialism is the set of ideas, concepts, and agencies used to structure the behavior of a people, and here's the key, into what is required to bring about a harmonious, stable, and prosperous society. Read the rest of it. In accordance with the will of those in power. Got that? That's what cultural imperialism is about. Cultural imperialism is the standard that has been set by those who want to control you into the way they want you to live. That's cultural imperialism. The root word of culture is the word what? Cult. Yes. And we've been taught that the word cult is a bad thing. The word cult in and of itself is not a bad thing. Cult simply means the way of a particular people or the way of a particular group. That's all a cult is. We think that cult is satanic. Do you not know, and think about this, do y'all not know that every church denomination thinks the other denomination is a cult? Yes. The Jehovah's Witnesses think the Baptists are a cult. The Baptists think the Church of God and Christ is a cult. Y'all follow what I'm saying? That's really deep because y'all all sing the same song. <laughs> But y'all got different belief systems, but when it comes to the songs y'all think, it don't matter. Y'all the same song. The word cult 
agriculture is the root word cult, and it is seen in other words like what? Agriculture, what else? Horticulture and cultivate. Okay, so you need to understand what cultural imperialism means. Running through all of these terms is the idea of human effort and influence in the growth and development of something. And that's what culture is all about. Culture is about determining the behavior of a people. We must understand the power of cultural thought. Everybody say cultural thinking. Cultural thinking. Now even though I just asked you to say it, you do it all the time. You do it all the time. We were raised to think culturally. You see, in fact, cultural thinking is the result of what we call compulsive behavior. You do it and don't even know you're doing it because that's what you were raised to do. You think culturally. And that's why when somebody comes along with another way of thinking or outside of your circle of awareness or outside of your cultural paradigm, you frown on it. You see? I remember back in 1970, I came home from high school and I had on a dashiki. <laughs> My grandmother, who was the state supervisor of women in the Church of God in Christ for the state of New Jersey, she came and looked through the peephole in the door. She said, boy, what is that thing you got on? I said, it's a dashiki, Grandma. A what? A dashiki. You ain't coming in this house with that thing on. And I honestly had to take it off, give it to her through the door with the chain on it, through the crack of the door, and she took it and put it in the sink and set it on fire. You know why? Because within the parameters of her Church of God and Christ awareness, that was satanic. That was of the devil. And it had to be burned. You see what I'm saying? And then I needed to be saved. Y'all follow what I'm saying? So we must understand how powerful cultural thought is. Social culture, the shaping of what? Human behavior is the goal of what two areas? Religion and what else? Education. Everybody say religion is a control mechanism. Did y'all grab that? Everybody say education is also a control mechanism. Now really what's deep about that is the word education, the root word is the word educe. E. D-U-C-E, which means to reach into a person and pull out what's in them. <clears throat> but in most of our way of thinking, educate means to brainwash. Educate means to teach or tell a person what they are supposed to think. That's not educate. Educate means to a person and bringing out of them their potential. It's the word educe. Because there are cultural errors, there's a need for cultural reformation. What cultural errors are you talking about, Brother Ray? Look around the room. All I see in this room are Africans. That's all I see in here. Yep. Regardless of your skin tone, I, all I see is non-white people in this room. Unless I'm not looking good. <laughs> but I don't see anybody. <laughs> and like Dr. Ben says, okay, if you ain't white, that means you're African. Period. Real simple. Even though they're now passing laws, in case y'all didn't know this, the new definition of white now is any people, any ethnic people of Europe or North Africa. Don't take my word for it, just get a job application. And look on the back of the job applications that you get now and see the definition of white. They made white folk North Africans now. Isn't that something? 
That's something how the United States Census Bureau can make that determination. Just like they decided that Egypt ain't in Africa no more. It's in the Middle East now. Like there is a, a far east and a near east and, and a Middle East. Come on, man. There are cultural errors. And when I look at black people, when I look at Africans, who have lost the awareness of being African because of cultural imperialism, that's a cultural error. And because of these cultural errors, there's a need for reformation. We become imitators of our cultural influences. For example, kissing. Why do you think that when you go out on a date, you have to kiss goodnight? Who told you that? <laughs> I saw a brother, talking about it just, just a couple weeks ago, a few days ago, I saw a brother, he had to be well in his late 30s maybe, almost 40 maybe. I, I'm not good at estimating people's ages. And I'm walking down, I'm driving down the street, he's walking down the street, and I see this brother, and his pants, was underneath his butt, not, not hanging low on his butt, I mean actually underneath his butt. I mean I'm watching his, his, his skivvies, as we call it in the Marine Corps, his drawers, and he is walking like this. <laughs> He's walking on wide leg, right? right. Now, the reason why you walk wide leg is to keep the pants from falling down any further. And something came over me. I just had to take the risk of getting into a fight. I, want, I, I pulled over, I started to say, man, why don't you pull your pants up? But that's not what came out. What came out was, brother, where did you get that idea from? Okay. Okay. That's what came out. You see? Cultural influences. And when I asked him in that manner, he looked at me as if to say, <laughs> <laughs> You know, and like he thought for a moment. The way I'm wearing my pants really did not come from my mind. But evidently an outside influence is dictating to me how I should wear my pants. And he began to pull them up because he didn't want to be influenced so easily. You follow what I'm saying? We become imitators of our cultural influences. Kissing, hugging, worshiping. How many times have you been in church and you've seen people Shout the same way. Yeah. Hold on to the back of the pew. <laughs> the same way. They all speak in tongues in a particular church the same way. You got what I'm saying? Emotional reactions to things. Even saying those magical words of what? I love you. Yeah. Why is it, brother, that you think that you can't make any headway with sister until you say, I love you? I love you. That's cultural influences. There are problems that exist. And I used to look at us and wonder what's really wrong with the individual. But notice what I have here. If 3% of the population comes down with an illness, then we must look at the habits and lifestyles of the sick individuals. Got me? If only 3% of the population come down. But now if 50% or more of the population come down with the same illness, then we must look not at the individuals, but at some social or environmental cause of this problem. And when I see so many of our people suffering from the same dis-ease, 
I didn't say disease. I said dis-ease. When I see so many of us suffering from the same issues, then I realize it's not really their fault. Evidently, something has been put in place that we as a people are messing from, messing. I got my cell phone, forgot to turn it off. That, that's got us messed up here. You see? Turn this thing off. Let's look on. The causes of many of the problems that we have stem from the beliefs and customs that we hold in common. And these beliefs and customs come from something called what? Culture. Culture. The causes of many of the problems that we have stem from the beliefs and customs that we hold in common called culture. Everybody read what I have there. What does it say? I must stop blaming people for imitating their cultural influence. Please hold on to that. That's where we mess up. We keep blaming each other for imitating a cultural influence and we don't even realize we're doing it because we have lost our own identity to that degree. For example, consider the status of women within the context of some cultures. What would make a man say something like, in the good old days, marriages were healthy? What does that mean? <coughs> In the good old days. You see, things are different now. In the good old days, women were not as free to be as vocal as they are now. That was taboo. You see? But we're in a different day now. Back in the good old days, women did not take care of themselves. Women did not support themselves. Women lived in their Daddy's house, live in their brother's house. It ain't like that now. Sisters ain't going to let you run over them now, and you living in their house. Sisters ain't going to sit back and let you do what you want to do, brother, and you driving their car. <laughs> it don't work like that now. See, so when it says the good old days, what makes a brother say that? Because culturally speaking, I mean, it's some deep stuff, man. Do y'all not know based on culture, women have a low status in society? In some cultures, women have to walk behind the man. In some cultures, a woman is not allowed to get a divorce. The man is, but the woman isn't. You see? Cultures. For example, in 585 A.D., the Roman Catholic Church decreed, what church did I just say? Roman. Roman. Roman Catholic Church decreed that women did not have a soul. What a thing to say. Some bishops decided women don't have a soul. See, you got to really understand how deep this thing goes. You really need to understand how the Roman Catholic Church feels about women, period. You really need to understand this whole Greco-Roman concept about the female principle, period. You see, when they went into Africa and saw how the ancient Africans <coughs> held the woman in high esteem and venerated her so dearly, they couldn't take it. Right. And those who've been with me in Africa, you can bear witness, man. All over Egypt, you see where they went and just chiseled the woman out of the stone completely. Just defaced any rep anything that was female, they defaced it. See, in the ancient African trinity, you had father, son, and mother. Y'all hearing me? The Roman Catholic Church couldn't take that. So they went into Egypt and they chiseled mother out and replaced her with a ghost. So now we have what's called father, son, and holy ghost. How you going to have a son without a mother? <laughs> Why is it that in Christian, in, in the white man's religion, let me say it like I teach Dr. Biz. Why is it the white man's religion, God can't have a woman? 
That's, and that's deep. I'm saying that I can see some of y'all got a problem with that. Because you, your culture just did not give you the idea of God having a woman. Why can't God have a goddess? Come on. Why can't he? Shucks. That's when like the movie came out, The Last Temptation of Christ. Church folk had a fit. Because the movie depicted that Jesus had sex. Why can't he have sex? I mean, if he had existed, what would have been wrong with that? You have it? <laughs> Y'all see what I'm saying here? That's a deep thank you, man. <laughs> That's why the Roman Catholic Church keep messing with little boys. That's why. Because there's a there, there is a human passion and need there called sexual fulfillment, and these priests are gonna do that one way or another. So you have you ain't gonna let them have a woman, so they're gonna take your child in. Dang. But then again, you gotta understand how deep this goes. They don't see nothing wrong with that. You know why? Everybody say agape. Agape. How many of y'all have ever heard that word before? Wow! Look at the hand. And most of you raise your hands, I bet you heard it in the context of a church somewhere. Yeah. Agape Christian Center. Or Agape Fellowship. Or da 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 da. And they tell you Agape means love, right? Yeah. Well, everybody say this. Storgion. Storgion. That's spelled S-T-O-R-G-E-O-N. Storgion. Everybody say Eros. Eros. Spelled e -R -O -S. Say Phileo. Phileo. P-H-I-L-E-O. And say agape, a g a p e. All four of those words that I just gave you are Greco-Roman terms, which simply means in English love. <coughs> you got me, okay? The thing is, what we don't know is that the word agape in the Greek means the highest form of love. Are y'all grabbing what I'm saying? Yep. Okay, now because we black folk think on a divine level, when we say the highest form of love, we automatically equate that with God. Right. Y'all grabbing me? But when the Greeks came up with this word agape, they didn't have a God consciousness. Y'all grabbing what I'm saying? Yes. So what was it meaning in the minds of Greeks? who didn't mean it to be God. The highest form of love in the Greek culture is adult male to child male sex. <laughs> Are y'all hearing this? So you now you understand why the Roman Catholic priests have no problem sodomizing little children because that in their cultural paradigm is agape. So you need to stop saying agape. And those of you who go to Agape Christian Fellowship, every time you say it now, would you hear my voice? <laughs> agape means adult male to child male sexual love. Am I making sense, people? Understand how deep this thing is, man. Yes. And it's deep because they symbolize agape in the cross. <laughs> Grab this. You see, the ancient symbol of our spirituality is the ankh. I see some of you got one on. Okay, the ankh, the top of the ankh is an oval shape which represents the womb of the woman. The bottom part of the arm represents the male phallus or the penis. The sides of the arm represents 
The fallopian tubes are the ovaries where the eggs come through to produce the offspring of the children. And let me tell you how this works, like you don't already know this. <laughs> when the male penis has an encounter with the woman's womb, and seed and sperm are released, you have a baby, or it produces life. That's why the ankh is the symbol of eternal life. The white folk went in and put cement over the oval part, cemented it up, and chiseled in a small little penis. <laughs> and what's really deep is this show you how sick this is so you gotta understand this symbology the steeple on a church represents the male penis y'all grabbing this it is the symbol of resurrection which is really a derivative of the two words rise erection that's what the ark in the cemetery is. I mean, the, 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 the uh, obelisk in the cemetery is all about. When you go to the graveyard, you see symbols to resurrection. Now, when you take the steeple on a, on a church, which represents a penis, and then you put a cross <laughs> on top of that steeple, what does the bottom part of the cross represent? A penis. <laughs> I didn't mean to go into this right here. <laughs> but when you take a penis and connect it to a penis, that's homosexual activity. <laughs> now you don't know this because you don't understand the power of symbology. Okay? But you see it in your music departments, don't you? Yes, you do. Little faggots be up there directing choirs and stuff. <laughs> Playing the music. And pastors walking along holding on to the invisible handrail. Right. <laughs> you see all that, man. But it's okay, you know why? Because the blood of Jesus covers it all. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny. I'm trying to show you our predicament. Yeah. And you want to know why we're messed up as a people. Okay. Yeah. You see, the Roman Catholic Church got a problem with the female. So that's why they decreed women don't have a soul. In 1000 AD, Roman Catholic Church decreed that noble men had the right to rape peasant women. One of the most effective ways to suppress a people is by putting a device in place that will disassociate a people from their what? God. From their God, what else? Yeah. Their spirituality, what else? Their culture, their culture and what else? Yeah. Their history. Yeah. Wow. And such devices have been used against us as a people. Yes. How many of y'all saw the movie Sankofa? Yeah. Sankofa. Please see it. Get it. Be sure you find that movie and watch it and see how they beat this sister in this movie. Beat her. Beat her to make her accept a culture that wasn't hers. Those who have any sense of ethnic and cultural pride are punished. And I want y'all here today who you know that the ancestors have been rising up in you to get you to take a stand for who you are. But there's a punk spirit <laughs> that parades among us as people. We talk all bold and everything when we get with another conscious person. But as soon as you get back to the unconscious community that you're around, you punk out. Now, mind you, I'm not saying be bold in your appearance. Some people say, 
I stand up for African consciousness <laughs> because you have locks, you have a dashiki, you got an arc that's 16 inches long. <laughs> you wear. I'm not talking about that kind of representation because I see too many people who look conscious, but they're not conscious. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, it's not about how you look on the outside. That's one of the brothers and sisters, I, I really, that's one of the reasons why I wear a shirt and tie. Okay? Because, see, I'm trying to reach people. Got me? And if I come locked down, up down, dashiki down, they're going to run before I get a block close to them. Really? They see me coming a mile away. So when they see Dr. Hagens walk up to them and I speak to them, that you know, their defenses are down. And then when I say something like, man, you need to understand that if there was an Adam in the Bible who was with us today, the oldest he'd be, he'd be about 7,000 years old. Okay, and there's a structure on the, uh, in Cairo on the Giza Plateau called the Sphinx, and it's at least 18,000 years old. Who built it? You ain't expecting to hear nothing like that from brother in certain suit and tie. I got you now. <laughs> I got you, cause I just, you know, and then, and then, you know, y'all see what I'm saying? Those who have any sense of ethnic and cultural pride are punished, while those who identify with our oppressors are rewarded. Why is that? Why are we rewarded for identifying with our oppressors? The powers that be have achieved the ability. Oh, this is deep to confuse and dissuade resistance to their cultural, anti-spiritual, and economic rule. You hear that? They have achieved the ability to confuse and dissuade, dissuade, or distract us from resisting their cultural and anti-spiritual and economic rule. That's how, they, that's how they got us, man. Because they tell us, number one, what, what's, what's that? WWJD. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw that, I thought they had the letters backwards because there's a radio station in New Jersey called WWDJ. And I thought they had just misprinted the, you know, the call letters for the radio station. And then somebody told me WWJD stands for what would Jesus do? So that's the question, that's the paradigm that many black folk now use in response to a predicament. Oh, grab what I'm saying. How many of y'all have been taught to love your enemy? Come on, be honest. Oh, Were you taught to love your enemy? Yep. Now, come on. I see a whole group of people over here didn't even raise their hand. Like y'all been in, around African countries all your life. Y'all well. When y'all went to Sunday school, they taught you to love your enemies. They taught you to pray for them who would misuse you. Didn't they teach you that? They taught you to turn the other cheek, didn't they? Yes. Come on, black folk. Why do you want to do a thing like that? I mean, think. If somebody walks up to you and slaps you, why do you want to say, here? Hit me again. That don't make no sense. If I know you're trying to kill me, <coughs> Why do I want to pray for you? <laughs> now, you know how deep this is. We really don't want to do that. But cultural influence won't let us be in peace. That's why, you know what we say? We say, you better be glad I'm saved. <laughs> That's what we say. Or if I wasn't saved. <laughs> Everything in us is telling us to wear them out. But your Christianized cultural influence said, no, 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 pray for them. But you got to somehow or another let them know that you really want to whoop their behind. So you better be glad I'm safe. Who told you you couldn't knock your enemy out? Who told you that? I promise you, if we did that, we wouldn't be in the condition we're in as a people. All right. I don't, usually, I don't usually admit to this, 
But I put a song on the internet not too long ago, a couple of years ago. When you having trouble on your job. Anybody ever hear that? You heard? I'm about to. You got it, okay. You heard it. Yeah, I'm the guy who did that. Yeah. And it's deep because I had more church folk rebuke me for that song. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You a pastor putting out something like, I'm keeping it real. I said, you feel the same way. you just so phony, you can't say it. Because your testimony will be blemished. You follow what I'm saying? Tell it like it is, man. Knock your enemy out. <laughs> Children, I'm not saying go to school and fight now. <laughs> I'm not saying that, okay? Please don't, don't, don't take it like that, okay? No, I don't want y'all going to school saying, Dr. Hagen said knock my enemy out. I, I don't mean it like that. Okay, I don't mean it like that. What I mean is we got to stop being punks. That's what I mean. We got to stop letting people abuse us and we do nothing about it. That's what I'm talking about. We got to stop letting people, you know, racism is real, brothers and sisters. It ain't gone nowhere. You can't pray it away. The seeds for success, this is very important, especially academic success, are most effectively planted where? At home. At home. Stop looking for the school to put this in your child. Stop looking for your religious institution to put this in your child. Parent, you got to put it in your child. But it's hard to put it in your child if you don't live it yourself. The presence of books in the home and parents who read and discuss ideas and current affairs all may almost always influence children to read and to care about things of the mind. Now the problem is, how is that going to happen, parent, if you are occupationally preoccupied and your child is an orphan? What are you saying, Brother Ray? My child ain't no orphan. Yeah. If you're not there to raise them because you have to leave before they go to school, so you have to send them off early to preschool care, and then when they get out of school, they have to go to after school care because you ain't off work yet. Who's really raising your child? But that's by design. That's by design, man. See, the whole thing is to disintegrate the black family unit so that mama has to work two jobs to try to make ends meet. Are y'all grabbing this? Yes. yes. So if mama's not there, well, look at here, man. How is a parent going to get involved in the child's intellectual development? By the time you get home, mama, it's like 6 o'clock, 6.30 at night. It's too late to really cook a decent meal. So you buy a Happy Meal. Or you stop by whatever little fast food place and pick your child up something, putting all that embalming fluid in your child. Y'all hear me? It's embalming fluid, man. That's what they use to preserve the meats and stuff. Formaldehyde. So you're feeding your child all this stuff. And by the time they eat that, you tired, you didn't have a, a crazy day, you don't have time to regenerate. Your child hasn't seen you all day, and they want to spend some time hugging you, and you don't have the energy to give them the attention they need back. Y'all see this cycle? Then it's time to put them in bed, only to wake up the next morning and do the same thing all over again. And you want to know why children have no problem going upside their parents' head today. <laughs> they don't even really feel like you're their parent. That's right. there's, no, uh, there's no connection there. Too many African-American homes are headed by parents, single or otherwise, who lack interest in the long-term efficacy of education, who do not insist that their children learn. And one of the reasons why you don't insist that your child learn, because you didn't like to learn. Right. You see what I'm saying? Everybody say a parenting initiative. 
A parenting initiative has to be established. An initiative that forces parents and children to become introspective and diligent. At the core of the black male crisis, what crisis did I just say? Black At the black male crisis is our failure to assume total responsibility for the destiny of our children, wow. our future. Right. Our Nearly 100 years ago, educator and civil rights attorney, Charles Hamilton Houston said of black people in education, I quote him, without education there is no hope for our people, and without hope our future is lost. Now it's really something, man, because you'd be surprised how many of us don't see a need to do this. And the number one reason, I've got to go here with y'all, the number one reason why we don't see a need to invest in our future is because we've been taught we ain't got no future. Now, I don't mean somebody actually came to you and said, y'all ain't got no future. Right, right. I don't mean it like that. We have been subliminally taught that there is no future. Because Jesus is coming back any day. <laughs> Understand how this works. Based on the way I grew up, I ain't supposed to have no five grandkids. Jesus was on his way back when I was 10 years old. Y'all yeah. <laughs> hearing this? He took a, he'd take a long time getting there. <laughs> My great grandmother used to say when I was a child, he's on his way back. He'll be here any day. Now think how deep this goes. In the mind of a child, when they hear that, you just canceled out their future. You just canceled out any plans for going to school. <laughs> Ain't no need of me going to college. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? I know it sounds a little funny, but that's, that's how deep this works. That's like telling me that the end of the world is coming next week. If the end of the world is coming next week, ain't no need to go into work. <laughs> ain't no need to pay no more bills. That's the same reality here. You see what I'm saying? By any means necessary, African adults must teach African children to take hold of their lives. Young people, y'all hear what I'm saying? Okay? You've got something to look forward to. Don't you ever forget that. I'll never forget one day I went into a store to buy something, and this little child walked up to me and said, may I help you? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Can you? You know, and he said, well, what is it you're looking for? And he said it was such dignity. He had to be about seven years old. He said it was such dignity, I told him. <laughs> and he directed me to it. And, and then ushered me to the counter. And when I got to the counter, I found out what was going on. This was his dad's business. And he knew that one day, at seven years old, he knew that one day, this is going to be mine. What do our children have to look forward to? And we, and we, get, and we blame them for premature pregnancy. We blame them for engaging in the activities that they engage, in, engage into, but we don't provide a structure of hope and expectation for them. We need to start being about that as a black community and teach our children to take hold of their lives. While we should continue to acknowledge the debilitating effects of racism, we cannot afford to live as victims. Stop speaking like a victim. Stop talking about what the white man did to you. Thank you. Stop doing that. You've given energy to your own defeat. Stop saying they ain't gonna, they won't give me no job. Why are you, why are you looking for them to give you a job? <laughs> oh man, I'm feeling this thing here today. Why are you looking for them to give you anything? Everything the world has came from us. Don't you create your 
your own job. I'm serious about that. It's in you. It's, I mean, it's some deep stuff, man. God put it in us. We can accomplish anything we want to. Blows my mind, man, how you can take a black man who can't even read, who can build almost anything you want him to build. He can count money, though. <laughs> can't read, but he can count money. <laughs> yeah. The natural talent that's in us. Little children, like these little children right here, man, just naturally talented. They get up and start singing, start dancing, start doing things. And white folk look at our little children and say, did you send them to school for that? <laughs> no, it's in us. You ain't got to ask them to give you anything. We must forge a world of what? Self-determination Self parallel to that of society's racism. An evil that is not disappearing anytime soon. Please don't think racism is going anywhere. Just because we got a chocolate president, don't be fool. Don't fool yourself. And notice I said chocolate. Wow. Obama has never identified himself as a black man. Never. I'm not black either. And he's not going to. He doesn't identify himself as a Negro. <laughs> He's not going to identify himself with us, period. And if you think it's going to happen, think again. <laughs> brothers and sisters, I got to drop this on you. Don't, don't, don't be not dismayed. The office of a president simply means that he does, not just the United States, any corporation, he does what the board of directors tells him to do. And the United States is a corporation. Y'all hear that? All right. And I'm going to leave y'all, some of y'all love him, so I'm going to move on. It is imperative that people of color determine what kind of definition? Right definition. Our histories and cultural value systems. We must not allow ourselves to be subject to any identification other than an African mm. one. Wow. <laughs> it is also imperative that our women find solace in our own histories. Yes. <laughs> And in their personal contributions and definitions, and I put that there on purpose, because sisters, be honest with you, it's really up to you. Yeah. It really is. And the reason brought out is because they know that you maintain the power. And you are the one who becomes emotionally attached to a thing. It's some deep stuff because I get emails and phone calls about it all the time. And if you've listened to Black Liberation Radio, you've heard people call in with the same situation. Brothers call in saying, Brother Ray, you know, man, my wife just, my wife ain't hearing this, man. My, my lady ain't hearing this, man. And I say, brother, be patient with her. Because if the sister ever gets this, you will have a queen in Zynga. You will have a Yamasante wife. You see what I'm saying? Because the sisters get emotionally attached to a thing. What's, I'm sure how deep this goes, man. A sister can clearly see that something ain't right. And won't put it down. Still hold on to it. Because she's emotionally attached to it. That's just the nature of the woman, man. You see, I see sisters who know their son ain't no good. No, he ain't no good. You know, and still willing to put your house up to bail him out of jail. Because you are emotionally attached to him. See? I've seen, you know, in law, in law, when I was in law enforcement, I used to see women lose their houses. 
Y'all put your credit on the line for a brother you know ain't staying around. Yeah, go out and sign for him to get a car. I hope they didn't get ready. I hope ain't nobody else in y'all get no car. <laughs> sign for him to get a car. Put your, you know why? Because you are, everything in you, everything in you is saying, uh-uh, don't do that. But you're emotionally attached to it. That's the way God wired you. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm glad God did wire y'all like that. Because that's the strength that has enabled y'all to keep us alive as a people for the last 500 years that we've been here. Sisters, if you ever grab this message of liberation, wait, man, who? Because like I say, we brothers get it, and we talk about it. Okay? See, when men get a thing, they talk it. When y'all get hold of a thing, y'all make it a reality. That's just the way God wired you, man. That's a good thing. If we don't find who we are, we will become consumed by self-centered desire. And the thing about it is the desires that we will come, become consumed with are the desires that European cultural influences have put on us. Like, is this thing called Vivace or? Versace. Oh, what is it? Versace. Versace. <laughs> Going and buying shoes you don't need. Oh, that's right. Some of y'all got a room just for shoes. <laughs> shoes are important. <laughs> See what I'm saying? A brother get a black pair of shoes, a brown pair of shoes. <laughs> he all right. <laughs> y'all got to have a pair of shoes to match every color in your outfit. See, that's, yeah. We will get hung up in decaying negative self-images that become poisonous and not healthy for the African community. Through cultural imperialism, our people have been stripped of what? Their identity, Their identity and redirected to definitions provided by those who created and left a legacy of suppression. That's why I like to do this so y'all can read it and actually see. Sometimes when you read it, it sinks in a little deeper. Okay? We have been stripped of our identity and redirected to definitions provided by our enemy. Y'all grabbing that? Yes. It's, really, it's really painful to me when I hear black people say things like, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. <laughs> that hurts. I'm going to tell you why it hurts. Okay, because first of all, they're speaking, they, they left Christianity. Got me? Because they knew that that wasn't real. So they left it. And they still went to an identity that was created by the same people who created Christianity. You see? Now what's painful about saying, when I hear my people say I'm a Hebrew Israelite, or hear them say I'm a Mohammedist, or they hear them say I'm a Christian, what's painful about that is that's what I call an epitomous identity. Hmm. Brother Ray, what do you mean by that? An epitome. And write it down. E-P-O-N-Y-M-Y. Epitome. That's how it's pronounced. Epitome means that you're taking on the identity of someone who never existed. So when you say, I'm a Hebrew, well, where did that come from? It came from the Bible, right? There was a dude in the Bible called Jacob, in the Bible now, named Jacob, who wrestled with the angel all night long, Yes. right? And because after he wrestled with the angel and didn't give up and was faithful and everything, God, in the Bible, God says to Jacob, henceforth now, I'm going to change your name from Jacob. You're going to henceforth be called Israel. Now, why did God name him Israel? <coughs> why? why? 
Why the word Israel? Why not Malcolm? <laughs> Why Israel? Because it's going back to Africa. Is is Isis. Ra is the name of the manifestation of God and the sun in the sky. And El is the prefix for the word God. You see? But what's deep about it is Jacob never existed. Are y'all hearing me? Everybody, okay, okay. Oh, you serve below. Everybody say this. Anything can be real. Anything can be real. In literature. In literature. Y'all get that? In literature, anything can be real. Okay? That's why the Bible says it is written. You must understand, just because the Bible says it is written don't mean it happened. It means just what it says. It is written. <laughs> Got me? And if we want to make something happen simply because it's written, then that means Little Red Riding Hood outran the wolf. Because <laughs> that's written too. <laughs> Got me? No, man. There was no Jacob. Please understand that. So if there was no Jacob, how could God change his name to Israel? In literature it happened, but not in history. Got me? So if there was no Jacob, there could be no Israel. So how are you going to call yourself an Israelite? You see? It hurts me when I hear our people so void of their own identity that we have to look into the literature of our oppressor to find an identity for ourselves. That hurts. In order for the dominant culture, read this with me. What does it say? In order for the dominant culture, and by the way, who is that? Caucasian. European, right? Yes. Here in America, Kaka, it's European. Let's keep it real. That's the dominant culture in this country. Okay? Let's read it. In order for the dominant culture to do what? To remain, remain dominant. dominant. Stop, 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 stop. That's what it is about. Our, our great ancestor warrior scholar, Dr. John Henry Clark, said, don't ever think that those in power are going to give up their power. Don't ever think that. I remember when President Obama got elected, I saw black folk in the street crying and jumping up and down. Like white folk was going to give up their power. Don't ever think that, man. And if he don't do what they want him to do, trust me, history speaks to that. In order for the dominant culture to remain dominant, Read it. What does it say? It must supply identities and definitions that function as a form of psychological slavery, discouraging aspirations and stifling the strength and will to be free of the people who they have targeted for suppression. Read it a couple more times. <laughs> has put a mechanism in place to act actually put you in the position to not even want to be free. You don't want to be free. Mm. You don't want to be free because that's too much work. <coughs> Freedom is something that has to be pursued. Freedom is something that has to be diligently sought after. Freedom is something you have to study for. See, we were raised saying you ain't got to do nothing because Jesus paid it all. All you got to do is believe. And that's where some of us are. I, Brother Ray, I, Brother Ray, I hear you. I hear what you say. I hear what you say. You don't know. You wasn't there. You don't know when, you don't know 
way. <laughs> you don't know what the Lord has done for me. It ain't about that. I'm trying to get you to understand that the only way you gonna be free is learn to think for yourself. This ain't about exercising faith. Look at somebody next to you and say, when you have faith, that means you don't know. Please understand that. When you know a thing, you don't have to have faith about it. You only put faith in what you do not know exists. That's wise faith. <laughs> and got y'all walking around talking about, well, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Think about that. Come on, let's take 30 seconds and rehearse that one more time. <laughs> now, that's some deep stuff. I used to preach that all the time. Faith all right. is the substance of things hopeful. Hey. The evidence oh. Oh. You are a fool for even walking around saying something like that. Think about it again. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It's some deep stuff, man. I, that is really a dumb statement, man. I mean, it really is. The substance of things hoped for. Hope never comes. Never has substance. Hope never comes. Think about what I'm saying here. If it comes, then you don't know hope. You don't know hope for something you have. And people get happy on hope. Like this dumb song they got out. My ship is coming in. Oh. My ship has finally come. Now, I know some of y'all like that. I know you do because they play it all the time. And that's where the cultural influence comes in. But if you just think about it for a moment, why are you getting happy? Because he said his ship is coming. <laughs> but think about it. He said his ship is come. What you jumping up and down for? My ship has finally come. <laughs> And then if you really look at the words, he says, I can see it out on the ocean. Well, it ain't come then. <laughs> you guys, imagine, imagine, okay, let's see this now. Come, all right, just put this in your mind. You standing on the, on the shore, on the dock, waiting for your ship to come in. Okay. And you see this ship way out there. And you start jumping up and down. Woo! My ship! My ship coming! Woo! My ship coming! Woo! Woo! And after a while, the ship start going that way. Oh, <laughs> whoa! Whoa! whoa. Oh, oh. Who told you that was your ship in the first place? You see, it's so bad to be so emotionally destitute. Yes. That all somebody got to do is give you an idea and you think it becomes your reality. Woo. See, that's why folk don't like me. 
Folk don't like what I'm saying because they say, Brother Ray, you take away all our joy, man. I want you to keep it real. Stop putting faith in something that doesn't exist. You know, and it's really disappointing to me when I see our people get happy over what they think is coming. Do y'all not know I used to see folk run around the church? I mean, take off and go run a track around the church because the preacher would look at a sister and say, your blessing is on the way. Your blessing is on the way. What's on the way? What? And that's enough for us. We keep going to church week after week after week to get that same thing. When you gonna learn? It ain't got here yet. When you gonna learn? And you pay your tithe to keep being lied to. Oh, I better move on, man. We must direct our energies toward the recreation of cultural alternatives informed by as ancestral visions of a future that celebrates our Africanness, and there's the word I used earlier, and induces, meaning reach into you and pull out the African warrior that's in you, the African scholar that's in you, the teacher that's in you, the griot that's in you, the mother that's in you, the father that's in you, the sister, the brother, the builder that is in each one of us to come forth. It's in us. We got to get it out. Our culture has been historically victimized by a European ideological and philosophical parameter. So we must reclaim our own image. We must look at a God that looks like us. Yes, isn't it deep? Dr. Ben said the Japanese God looked Japanese. Mm -hmm. Chinese God looked Chinese. Mm -hmm. The Hindu God looks Hindu. Mm -hmm. Then why doesn't our God look like us? Mm -hmm. It did at one time. Yes. Sure. One time. Absolutely. But now it's got blue eyes. <laughs> Blonde hair. Mm. Our salvation, and when I say our salvation, I mean our redemption, lies in our African ancientness and connectedness, not in a romanticized glorification of the past, but in a return to a true African center. And when I say a romanticized glorification of the past, some of us are actually romantically in love with ancient Africa. We ain't doing nothing today. But we spend a lot of time talking about what we did thousands of years ago. Y'all follow what I'm saying? We talk about the pyramids that we built. We talk about the great temples of antiquity that we built. Okay? And you can't even hold an apartment today. Something's wrong with that. Don't talk about the ancient past like that's really saying you ain't doing nothing today. From a right center, icons can be retrieved in our image that will allow us to tap the energy of the collective conscious will of our people. The group that has the power, the group that has the power to enforce its definition of reason or its culture so that it becomes the most reasonable, consequently has a mandate to control those whose reasoning abilities are judged to be less. Y'all grab that. In other words, the group that has the power to make you live like they want you to live, they must never, ever surrender that power. Because they have acquired everything they have acquired as a result of having their reason or their culture over you. A cultural revolution. Wow. What did I just say? A cultural revolution calls for the use of countless methods, ideas, 
theories and tactical procedures. This points to the utility of multimedia and incorporating everyone from poets to computer programmers, wow. painters to ball players, within each of us is the spirit to reject oppression and exploitation. That's natural in us. If you want to be a slave, something's wrong with you. <laughs> There's a spirit in us that has a longing to be free. I remember in the movie Amistad, this brother stood up in the, in, 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 the, in the box there in the court, and he just started, I mean, like, a, like the ancestors overtook him. I mean, it was a movie, but it, man, it was so powerful. And he just started saying, he didn't even speak English, but he just started hollering, give us free. Give us free. Scared the hell out of them white folks. <laughs> First of all, the white folks said, how is he speaking English? <laughs> I guess that was real tongues, huh? Yeah. Give us free! That's the spirit of the African. If you are complacent, being owned, something's wrong with you. It's our individual empowerment that will bring about a change. Ashe. Ashe. Thank you for listening.